Welcome everyone to a brand new reaction series. We are going to dive back into the deep well that is extra history. This is actually a series that goes back seven years, I believe. Uh, it's called The Resource War. And as I am preparing for my trip to France next week, and a lot of that's going to be focused on Normandy and the invasion beaches, uh, been doing kind of a deep dive into World War II history the last few weeks on my own. So I'm excited to study one of the most important aspects of the war. Listen, by the time you get to the 20th century, World War I, World War II, the other wars that take place during this time, uh, what happens on the front lines is only a tiny fraction of what goes into winning these wars because you've got the mass scale of production that has to take place in factories on the home front. You've got to feed these millions and millions of soldiers. The U.S. alone, you know, had like 16 million men and women in their armed forces by the end of the war. And we weren't even the largest. I mean, I think the Soviet Union probably had more. The Germans probably had a similar number to that. And then you have the Japanese and the Chinese and India and the British Empire, and uh, which India was a part of at that time, and the French and all these other dozens of nations that were involved in this war. Uh, so intelligence is a huge factor. Being able to transport goods and supplies and weapons is a huge factor. Dominating the skies and the seas matter. Uh, technology matters. All of it plays a role in winning this war. So the resource war is a part of that. So I'm excited to dive into this. As always, the link is in the description. If you'd like to go ahead and watch their entire series, I would encourage that. Watch the whole series, then come back and watch my commentary over the coming days as we add to and we learn together. Let's dive into the resource war. Cicero once said that the sinews of war were infinite money. Never has that been more true than in the Second World War. This little bonus extra history series is going to be all about the complex economic struggle that underpinned the most colossal conflict in human history. These episodes are happening courtesy of the good folks at Paradox, who, after seeing those old Punic Wars episodes we made, approached us asking to sponsor a few episodes about the economic aspects of World War II, in anticipation of the upcoming release of Hearts of Iron IV. And Holy cow, so this was all the way back when Hearts of Iron 4 came out. Uh, one of my all-time favorite PC games. I've done a bunch of uh, series playing Hearts of Iron 4 over on the gaming channel, VTH Gaming. The link's in the description if you haven't already checked out the gaming channel. It's a great topic idea, so let's jump right in. First, let me set the stage. The year is 1939. Storm clouds are gathering over Europe. Hitler has already grabbed Austria, and Czechoslovakia is being gobbled up. The Italians have conquered Albania. Even as many try to deny it, every nation knows war is coming. Meanwhile, in the East, the Japanese have annexed Manchuria and are pushing further into China. Chinese resistance movements have flared up. For all intents and purposes, the East is already at war. Yeah, and a lot of people will say that they really don't consider World War II to have begun September 1st, 1939 with the German invasion of Poland, but rather point to what Japan is doing uh, in East Asia. Uh, with China, Manchuria, things like that. Uh, you can make that argument, but I, I think 1939 typically is pointed to because it brings several new uh, world powers into this thing. Uh, so um, you got to remember, think about uh, just, for example, the rise to power of the National Socialists is enabled in part because of economic issues that are happening in Germany. World War I was largely won. Uh, because of an economic blockade of German ports by the British Empire with their navy. Um, and World War II is going to be driven by economics, right? The U.S. and Japan are going to go to war in large part because of access to oil. Uh, so this is a big part of it. You can have the most technologically advanced army in the world. You can have uh, the best of everything and you can have the most of everything. But if once the war starts, you're cut off from the ability to get, ar uh, get uh, your army's needs in terms of oil or rubber or aluminum or chromium or whatever it might be, uh, your long-term prospects are not great. But most of the major players all have one goal in mind. 
resources. Mm -hmm. Economic power, industrial installations, natural resources, these all needed to be gathered and hoarded as quickly as possible. Because And, you know, the argument is there to be made that, well, people say, well, what was Hitler thinking? It was so stupid for attacking the Soviet Union. And part of it was ideological. He viewed uh, Russians, he called them Bolsheviks, the same way he viewed Jewish people, for example, as like lesser human beings. And, but a lot of it was economic as well, trying to get access to those oil fields in the Caucasus. If you have a massive army and you don't have the resources at home, you've got to gather them somewhere. And that leads you to make decisions you might not otherwise make. Every state knows when war truly breaks all bounds, all the trade that keeps the world economy functioning will grind to a halt. Or so it was thought. In fact, many expected that the European nations would avoid war because their economies couldn't survive economic isolation. But that assumption hadn't kept the First World War from breaking That's out, true. and it wouldn't keep the Second. In truth, many of the pre-war planners had learned from the First World War and started preparing for just such a breakdown in trade years that's a great point is that, uh, you know, a lot of people argued the World War I could never last four years because the countries wouldn't be able to economically afford to keep their armies going, but they found a way. Um, but this time, those lessons have been learned. And so you're looking at your economy and you're thinking, OK, what is it going to cost us economically and in resources to be able to fight such a war? And who are we going to have to conquer to do it? And what are we going to have to save up for? What infrastructure do we need to be building now? All that stuff. It's an advance. So let's take a look at the economies of some of the major players right at the outset of the war. Mm. The first big three are Germany, France, and Great Britain. These are the major European nations that would be in direct conflict with each other from the get-go. Germany, having been disarmed after World War I, had come roaring out of the Great Depression with one of the largest armaments programs the world had ever seen. France had invested heavily in static defenses, and Great Britain had restarted its fleet construction program after the... So, I'll back up there just so we don't miss what he was saying, but um, a lot of industrialized nations used works programs, public works programs, to help kind of drive their way out of the Depression. Here in the United States, for example, you have... Things like the Tennessee Valley Authority. You have infrastructure projects, right? The government's investing money into things it needs, but it's also employing a lot of citizens and pouring money into the economy. Well, Germany did that too, but what Germany did was that it focused much more heavily on the military aspect of production early on, whereas countries like the U.S. didn't really start ramping up their military till 1940 invested heavily in static defenses, and Great Britain had restarted its fleet construction program after the lull for the Washington Naval Treaty. But to really compare these countries, we're going to have to talk numbers. The way I see it, there are four statistics you really have to consider when talking about countries involved in a global war. First, GDP, or gross domestic product. This tells you roughly how big an economy is, how much raw production it's capable of, which of course translates directly into tanks, bombs, guns, the material of war. And that's true. Uh, the, the only thing that can be a little misleading about GDP is if you have a massive country, uh, then maybe that GDP isn't as impressive as if you have a small country that's kind of punching above its weight in terms of its GDP. So that's where things like per capita income come into play. Second, population. When we're looking at massive global conflicts that are going to determine the very survival of nations, you've got to look at the manpower they can draw upon. The larger the population, the larger the armies that nation can field, with more industrialized countries being able to draw on larger sections of their populace without disrupting the flow of basic goods like grain. So yeah, um, again, same thing. Look at the massive numbers. The U.S. enlists something like 16 million men and women in the military. Uh, and those are all men and women who are no longer working in factories, that are no longer producing food on farms, that are no longer raising their children. All of that has to be accounted for in all of this. So the larger your population, the more men you can send to the front and still have people to run your factories and feed your armies back home. If a conflict becomes a long-term struggle, population count becomes increasingly important as attrition starts to mount. Third, territorial extent. This isn't a perfect measure by any stretch, but it serves to give us a surface level idea of relative natural resource mm. control. In modern economies that require everything from oil to rubber to aluminum to run, territorial extent gives us a very rough idea of how self-sufficient these economies might be if cut off from global trade. 
It also tells us how much ground a nation can give up without being knocked out of the fight. Though it is worth noting that greater territorial extent also generally makes mobilization more difficult and defense more complex. So it's kind of- That's true, uh, but for example, in World War I, the mistake was made by Germany that thinking and thinking that Russia was so huge uh, and therefore would be slow to mobilize. And they ended up mobilizing much faster than Germany expected them to. And it also gives you that advantage that Napoleon discovered and the Germans discovered that uh, you can attack hundreds of miles into Russia or in World War II, the Soviet Union, and still not even be close to entering the heart of their nation. Uh, and that also stretches you further and further away from your supply lines. And uh, it gives you this long area that you have to defend. Kind of a trade-off in some ways. Fourth, per capita income. Individual wage may seem like a strange metric when thinking about wartime economy, but it gives you a good idea of how developed an economy mm. is. The higher the individual wage, the more advanced an economy you're usually dealing with. And this is actually super important because, in general, larger economies can take bigger hits without yeah. crumbling. Bombing one factory won't cause production to grind to a halt. They'll have a greater ability to synthesize or find alternatives for natural resources they don't have. They have a better internal network for transportation and distribution and such. So a nation that has a more advanced economy, even if it has the same GDP as another country, can remain an effective combatant much longer than a nation with a less advanced economy. This and here's another, and I just learned this the other day uh, in a book I'm reading about uh, World War II, uh, just little things you don't really have a way of accounting for. For example, when the war breaks out, World War II, in the United States, something like one in four American families owned an automobile. So, you know, today, you know, pretty much most people have a car, but at that time it wasn't that way. But in Germany, it was something like one in 50. Well, that makes a difference when it comes to people being familiar with vehicles, uh, even tanks, things like that. Uh, the more familiar your country is with operating such vehicles, the more that translates into the military. But also, that means that you have more of a means of production for things like tanks. Because a lot of places, they went from making cars to making tanks or making Jeeps or making other vehicles. Uh, and you've already got that infrastructure for being able to do that, both in terms of the, the knowledge that your people have, but also the production factories that you have. This is why China collapsed into a guerrilla war almost immediately rather than fronting a centralized state effort. And it's why Italy capitulated so much quicker than Germany. It's also fascinating to think about in terms of the incredible Soviet effort to actually pick up mm. and move their entire industrial yeah. base in the face of a German invasion. But we'll get to that later. For right now, let's look at some numbers. Now, all of the monetary figures I'm gonna use here are in 1990 US dollars, just because that's how the most comprehensive data set I found converted it. So, the UK has a population of 47 and a half million, a territorial reach of 245,000 square kilometers, mm. a GDP of $284.2 billion, and a per capita income of about $5,983. So I'm wondering now, does that apply to the entire British Empire, or are we talking specifically just the UK. Now, when compared to Germany's numbers, with a population of 68.6 million, 470,000 square kilometers of territory, a GDP of 351.4 billion, and a per capita income of 5,126 per head, the UK's numbers may look a bit low. But first, we've got a factor in France, which had a population well, and of 42 we've got a factor million, in a overseas territorial territories, reach of 551. Right? Um, you know, Germany has some, yes. They've got some in Africa, some in the South Pacific. Uh, but for the most part, France and uh, the UK have just massive access to resources. Uh, you know, French Indochina, for example, which is Vietnam and others today. Um, you know, the, even the Netherlands has the Dutch East Indies. 1,000 square kilometers, a GDP of 185.6 billion and a per capita income of $4,424. And perhaps far more importantly, we also have to factor in the British Empire. If you add in all of the colonies and dominions that Britain held at the time, that's a whopping 483.8 million people, 34,179,000 square kilometers in territory, and 391 billion in GDP. But granted, if you leave out some of the more economically advanced dominions like Canada and Australia, the colony's collective per capita GDP was only $627. So less great. Sorry, I know that was a lot of numbers, but what does it all tell us? 
All of those numbers basically tell us that Germany needed to win this war before the UK could bring its empire to bear. Yep. But it also tells us that the British Empire was unwieldy. It was spread out, and it had an incredibly low per capita GDP in a lot of places, which meant that there wasn't a lot in those places that could be diverted to war production, and those sections of the empire would probably collapse at the first show of hostile force. And that reality very much played into the overarching strategy of the war. Blitzkrieg was not only a tactical or even a strategic idea, but an operational one. Germany had stockpiled material before the war. They believed they had better military leadership and better esprit de corps. Their great hope was to expand fast enough using those early advantages to win total victory. But there Yeah, so again, the idea here is we know that the longer a war goes on, the less likely it is for us to win. So we've got to win, win fast and hope that's enough. And the Japanese had the same idea in striking the United States at Pearl Harbor, right? They knew there was no way they could win a long-term conflict with the, the Americans in the Pacific. So you make a quick strike, you hope that gives you enough time to do what you need to do to build yourself up and then hope that the U.S. is set back to the point where they won't be willing to pursue this long term. Their more realistic planning told them that they still had no choice but to expand rapidly so that they could bring in the resources, population, and industrial capacity that they would need to fight a protracted war. Seizing an early advantage was Germany's best chance. Meanwhile, on the other side of the world, Japan was in much the same situation. The famous Japanese Admiral Yamamoto estimated that he could win for six months if the U.S. entered the war. Yep. But if Japan had not secured victory by then, loss was assured. If we look at the statistics for Japan and China, which I'll put down below just so I don't belabor you with more numbers, we can see that China has a substantially higher population, and thus also a higher GDP, but a much lower per capita there GDP. Meaning that China would probably lose a conventional war, but they'd still be very hard to occupy if they got any outside help. And then there were the two wild cards, the United States and the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union had vast natural resources, a huge population, and a high GDP, but with a low per capita wage, meaning they had a less advanced economy than many of the other European powers. Russia would play an enormous role in the struggle to come, but economically, its entire focus would be using what industrial resources it had to arm and equip the vast forces it could muster. The United States, on the other hand, for the entire length of the war, from 1938, well before it was involved, to the war's conclusion in 1945, had a GDP greater than every major Axis power combined. A GDP which was also greater than all the other major allies put together. Not only that, but the U.S. was protected by oceans from the conflict yep. itself. This is why the United States would serve as the arsenal of democracy. Join us next time as we talk about Lend-Lease and how American industrial output would be used to keep its beleaguered, soon-to-be allies afloat before the American nation gathered the will to fight. See you then. Yeah, great point is that, you know, World War I and World War II both. The U.S. is neutral at the beginning, but not really neutral. They're economically supporting the allies in both of those wars and especially in world war ii but uh this is going to be fascinating i think we're going to learn a lot and i think this is such a unstated much understated uh part of how the war was won so i'm excited to dive into it use the comment section below let me know your thoughts we'll be back tomorrow with part two thanks for watching